Uh, now, before starting any lesson, I always like to bless and salute you all in the name of Ahaya Bahashem Yashah Barak Atham. Uh, today is another edition of the GOCC Sabbath, and hopefully through the Spirit of the Heavenly Father and uh, through the grace of His Son Yeshaya, and through the Spirit of Rawak, we will be able to bring forth much understanding and much edification through the Spirit. Uh, today's lesson, the topic of today's lesson is called The Elders, okay? Once again, the title of today's lesson is The Elders. And basically what we're going to be discussing in today's lesson is not only the position of eldership and the requirements according to the Bible and the uh, what the Bible tells us concerning the position of an elder. Uh, we're also going to be going into some of the different hardships and some of the principles that go along with being an elder according to the Bible or one who is in position according to the Bible. Um, first and foremost, we're just going to start off with a simple uh, understanding of what an elder is. Uh, basically, an elder is a watchman or overseer okay a watchman or an overseer who was set up in order to watch over what the scriptures call the flock the bible often salakia uh, the bible often describes uh, the nation of israel and in the new testament those who were under the church they're often described as being sheep of a flock or sheep of a fold and those who are set over the sheep of the fold or the sheep of the flock are often described as shepherds okay and what we're going to do is we're going to give you some of the understanding according to the Bible on the position of a shepherd and we're going to start off in the book of Titus uh, what was that uh, 1 and 14 Titus 1 and 5 okay we're going to start off in the book of Titus chapter 1 verse uh, 5 Okay. And I'm going to get there with you. All right, we're in the book of Titus, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. And you can go ahead and read that. Titus, chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete that thou should have set in order the things that I wanted. So it says, for this cause have I set you in Crete. And as a matter of fact, let's go up to verse 1 of the book of Titus so we can get the sense of what Paul is saying in the book of Titus 1 and 5. We're going to go up to verse 1. Okay, go ahead. Verse 1. Paul, a servant of the Most High, and an apostle of Yeshua Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge in the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness okay go ahead in hope of eternal life so this is the hope we all hope for eternal life okay go ahead which the most high cannot lie but promised before the world began and this was promised before the world began go ahead but had in due time manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of the most high so in due time the most high committed his word through preaching and it states that it was a committed unto Paul. Paul was a preacher and an apostle of Christ. Okay, go ahead. Our Savior. And according to the commandment of the Most High, our Savior. Go ahead. Verse 4. To Titus, my own son, after the, com after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from the Most High, the Father, and the Lord Yeshua Christ, our Savior. Go ahead. For this cause left I thee in Crete. So, for this cause... Paul left Titus in Crete. Go ahead. That thou should have set in order the things that are wanting. That he may set in order the things that were wanting. Because in every area in which the gospel had been preached, what uh, the gospel had reached, you had brothers and sisters that were growing in the spirit and in faith. But along with that, they needed an elder or they needed an overseer who can oversee the progress of the church okay as Paul states to set in order the things that were wanting 
all right, because there are things that are needed in each area in which a church is established. And then there are men who are set in order to make sure that those things are attended to. We have an example here with Paul setting up Titus. Go ahead. And ordained elders in every city. And he ordained elders in every city to do what? As I had appointed thee. As he had appointed thee. All right. Go ahead. Verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of the Most High, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, nor striker, not given to filthy lucre. So these are some of the uh, requirements of one who is in an eldership position. Okay? So the main reason why we went to Titus chapter 1 verse 5 was to show you that according to the Bible, elders were set up in every city to establish and to watch over and provide the things that were wanting in the church. Okay? So let's go into our lesson that was prepared by Brother and Elder Yarak, uh, going into some of the principles and some of the hardships and some of the things that come with the position of eldership. Okay? Let's go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, and we're going here to the book of Ezekiel. Some people may ask, well, why are we going to Ezekiel? Well, we know that Ezekiel was a prophet. Uh, and the reason is because when we go to the book of Ezekiel, it tells us that he was set as a watchman over the children of Israel. Okay, he was set as a watchman. And that's basically the position and the purpose of one in an eldership position or any position established in the church. Okay. And with Ezekiel, with his ministry, and with his uh, prophethood, uh, the Most High gave him instruction. So we're going to read some of this instruction that was revealed and given unto the prophet Ezekiel concerning his ministry. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Alright, go ahead. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 1. Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, Eat that thou findest. So it says, I have said unto thee, son of man, eat that thou findest. And when you go to the chapter prior to chapter 2, and as a matter of fact, we're going to jump up to the last few verses of chapter 2, uh, we find that the Most High gives unto Ezekiel a roll. Okay? And it tells us that there was writing on this roll, both within and without. So we're going to read about this role so we can understand what it means when it tells us to eat what thou findest. Okay? Let's go up to Ezekiel chapter 2 and we're going to start at verse, let's start at verse 8. Ezekiel 2 and 8. Verse 8. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. So he says, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Meaning the rebellious house of Israel. Okay? He's telling Ezekiel to be separate, to be holy, to be sacred, and not to be as the rebellious house of Israel, who at this time was going off. Okay, go ahead. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And open your mouth and eat that I give you. So now we're starting to understand what it means when it tells us to eat what thou findest, or when the Lord told Ezekiel to eat what he found. Okay, go ahead. Verse 9, And when I looked, behold... And hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. So it says, a roll of a book was therein. Okay, go ahead. Verse 10. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And it says there was, it was written within and without. Uh, and that basically means that there was writing on the inside as well as the outside, okay, of this book. On the face, the front, as well as behind this book. Okay, go ahead. And there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. And it was written within his book, mourning, lamentation, and woe. Okay, so now let's go back to Ezekiel, the third chapter, to read about this roll that the Most High told Ezekiel to eat. He said, eat that thou findest. So now we're going to read about more about this roll. Okay, go ahead. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 1. 
Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. So eat that thou findest. Now we just read about this roll that was given to Ezekiel, which was written within and without. And within this particular roll was written lamentation, mourning, and woe. So he's telling Ezekiel to eat this roll. Go ahead. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. And go speak unto who? Unto the house of Israel. And go speak unto the house of Israel. Okay, go ahead. Verse 2. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. So he opened Ezekiel's mouth and caused him to eat the roll. The same roll we read in the second chapter. Go ahead. Verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat. And fill thy bowels with this roll. So he says, cause your belly to eat and cause your bowels to be filled with this roll. Alright, go ahead. That I give thee. Then did I then did I eat it. Okay, so Ezekiel ate the roll, go ahead. And it was given, and it was in my mouth as honey and for sweetness. And it says it was in his mouth as honey for sweetness. Now let's get some understanding of what it means about honey and sweetness. Let's go to the book of Psalms 119 and 103. Okay. Psalms 119 and 103. Okay, go ahead. Psalms chapter 119 and 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Remember. Ezekiel said that this roll was sweet. Okay, go ahead. Like honey. Go ahead. Yeah, sweeter than honey to my mouth. S sweeter than honey to my mouth. So this roll, this honey, represents the words of the Heavenly Father. Okay? So he told him to eat this roll, to eat the words, and go and preach into the house of Israel. All right, go ahead. Back to Ezekiel, the third chapter. You there? Yeah. Pick up where you left off. Verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And it was in his mouth as honey for sweetness. Now we're going to find out that this a similar role was given to John the Revelator while on the Isle of Patmos. And he was also told to eat a roll. Now Ezekiel tells us how when he ate this roll, and it was in his mouth as sweetness, or it was in his belly as sweetness. But John the Revelator, when he received the role, gave us the complete understanding as to what happens after you partake. Let's go to the book of Revelations, the 10th chapter, and we can start at the 8th verse. Because yes, when you first eat this roll, it goes in your mouth for sweetness. We're going to bring this around to show you how this relates to eldership or shepherding. All right. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 8. Okay, Revelation lock it. Revelation 10 and 8. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Revelation chapter 10, verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take a little, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea. So we're now getting the understanding of what it means when it speaks about a roll. Okay. When you go into the Old Testament when it says the roll in Hebrew that's uh, magala okay which means a roll but it goes back to the Hebrew word galal which means a volume all right and we know that Christ says that he comes in the volume of the book so when we speak about this roll it's speaking about the book these words as we read in the book of Psalms which is sweet as honey now John the Revelator was also given a book he was also given a roll to eat and we're going to see what he had to say about this role. Let's go ahead. And up on the earth. Verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat so it. So he said, the angel said, Take the book. John the Revelator said, Give me the book. And the angel said, Take it. Go ahead. And eat it up. And eat it up. Eat up this book. The same way Ezekiel was commanded to eat the book. Okay. Same way he was commanded to eat the book, go ahead. And it shall make thy belly bitter. And it shall make your belly bitter. Okay, go ahead. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. But in your mouth it shall be sweet as honey. So we've seen in Ezekiel, he mentions the sweetness about the word being as sweet as honey in the mouth. 
But John the Revelator completes it by letting us know that although it's sweet in the mouth, in the belly, it becomes bitter. And we're going to show you why it becomes bitter. Let's go back to the book of Ezekiel, the third chapter. Because once you receive this word, once you receive this knowledge and this understanding of the Most High, you will soon find out that the Most High is going to call you to a work. All right? And we're going to find out what that work is. The Most High don't just give us the word to play around with it, just to be able to say we know a few scriptures and to know a few precepts. He gives us this word for a purpose and for a calling. And it tells us to whom much is given, much is required. Okay? So the Most High requires something of us when we receive this word. And we're going to read about it, going back to the book of Ezekiel, the third chapter. All right, go ahead. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 4. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel. So after he gave him the roll to eat, he told him to go unto the house of Israel. So this was Ezekiel's calling, to get the knowledge so that he may go to the house of Israel and prophesy to and against the children of Israel. Okay, go ahead. And speak with my words unto them. And speak with my words unto them. All right? As the Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So Ezekiel was given the command to speak the Most High's words unto the children of Israel. Okay? He was the mouthpiece of the Most High. All right? Go ahead. Verse 5. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech. Because you are not sent to a people of a strange speech. You are not sent to a people of a strange speech, meaning a people of a different language. And we, when you do research into language, with language comes culture. Okay? So he's letting Ezekiel know that you're not going to a different people of a different language, a different culture, different uh, uh, principles and different ways of life than which you have. You're being sent to the children of Israel. Okay, go ahead. And of a hard language. And of a hard language, a language which you cannot understand. Go ahead. But to the house of Israel. But you're being sent to the house of Israel. Now, listen to how deep this message that's being relayed to Ezekiel. Let's check out how deep this message is. Okay, continue. Verse 6. Not too many people of a strange speech is of a hard language. Not too many people of a hard speech. You know what? And of a hard language. And of a hard language. So you're not being sent to many people of a hard speech and a hard language. Which means you're being sent to a people who understand as you understand, a people who live under the culture in which you were given, live under the law, statutes, and commandments that you were given. These are the children of the same people who were led out of Egypt, the same people who were led through the Red Sea by Moses, the same people who were showed the miracles in the wilderness, the same people that were in the wilderness 40 days or 40 years, okay? The same people who received the knowledge and understanding under the laws, statutes, and commandments. You're being sent to the same people. Okay, go ahead. Whose words thou cannot understand. You're not being sent to a foreign people who didn't go through the things that Israel went through, who didn't serve in Egypt. Okay? Didn't receive the laws, statutes, and commandments. Didn't speak a different language or a different tongue. You're being sent to the house of Israel. Go ahead. Surely had I sent them to. Because I, if I would have sent you to another nation, go ahead. They would have, they would have hearkened unto me. They would have listened unto you okay another nation who cannot now check out how deep this is another nation who cannot understand your language they can't understand the words that are coming out of your mouth and you cannot understand their words but yet if I would have sent you to prophesy to these people they would have hearkened they would have came why because they would have seen the signs they would have seen the power that the Most High was using to work with Ezekiel and this would have caused them to change okay and repent Okay, so he says you're being sent to the house of Israel, all right, of people who are foolish, hard-headed, and hard-hearted. All right, go ahead. Verse 7, but the house of Israel were not hearkening unto thee, for they were not hearkening unto me. So they, he said the children of Israel will not hearken unto you because they have not hearkened unto me. So this now brings us to the understanding of eldership and shepherding and being a watchman because this is our calling. Our calling is, as Christ tells us in the book of Matthew, the 10th chapter, in the 5th and 6th verse, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans into ye not, but go ye rather into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go preach, saying, 
the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this is our job, this is our duty when we're set up as watchmen. We're sent to the house of Israel. Okay? So, read on. For all the house of Israel are impudent. For all the house of Israel are impudent. So now when we're raised up, when the Most High raises us up as positions of leadership, and we're sent to the house of Israel, we have to deal with those same imputed, hearted, and hard-headed people. Okay, that the Bible speaks of the same people Moses had to deal with, the same people Ezekiel had to deal with. Okay, and with that comes much pain, it comes much sorrow, much mourning, much lamenting. The same thing that the Most High revealed unto Ezekiel. Okay, much pain and sorrow and lamenting comes with having to watch over the children of Israel. Okay, and this is the importance and some of the you know some of the things that may come with this particular position okay go ahead and hard-hearted so he says Israel is hard-headed and hard-hearted okay so when he received that role he received the word it was in his mouth as sweetness but it became bitter when he found out he had to go to those hard-headed stiff-necked Israelites okay go ahead verse 8 behold I have made thy face strong against their faces I've made your face strong against their faces Okay, so that he would not be confounded. Go ahead. And thy foreheads strong against their foreheads. And his forehead stronger against their foreheads. Okay, go ahead. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. And it says, as an adamant harder than flint have I made your, your forehead. So, lock you. so the Most High sends Ezekiel with a mission to the children of Israel. And he tells them that if he would have sent them to any other nation, they would have been hearkened unto the Most High's words. And we can see perfect examples of this all throughout history, even until the present. Okay? We can see the example with Islam. When Muhammad rose up and told the Ishmaelites that they were the greatest people on the face of the earth, and that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it speaks about Ishmael being a great nation. They took that information, and you know what they did? They became conquerors and rulers of the world through Islam. Okay? Under Edom. Okay? Let's use the example of them coming up under the Renaissance period. Putting up false images of Jesus Christ. For what the Bible says was an occasion to deceive the world. When they did that, they told their people that they were Jesus Christ. Okay? That Jesus Christ was white. The Most High was white. Was a European. Okay? And that they were the greatest people on the face of the earth. What happened? They were able to take over the world with that knowledge and understanding. Okay? But you go to Israel with this, the understanding that they're the greatest people on earth. They're the chosen people of God. They received the law, statutes, and commandments. Christ came for the Israelites. What do you get? Oh, no. <laughs> Not my Jesus. Okay? Not my God. He loves everyone. Okay? God loves everybody. Okay? We're all created equal. But the question is, if we're all created equal, why are you on the bottom? Okay, and other people are on the top. Okay, why are you marching every so often, screaming no justice, no peace? Okay, for you being uh, brutally beaten down in the streets by police. But what you say is for the color of your skin, if everyone is created equal. Okay? So we have to, well, just use this as an example. We're not going to go too far off the beaten path. Just use this as an example to show you the people that uh, Ezekiel was sent to. Okay, he was sent to the children of Israel who are hard-headed and stiff-necked. Okay, and he says that they will not listen to you, Ezekiel, because they have not listened unto me. Now imagine being sent on a mission to wake up with people who the Most High told you would not listen. Okay, the Most High said that these people would not listen. Now imagine having to go to these people and try to raise these people up. To tell them that they are the people of the Bible. Now, of course, they knew this back during Ezekiel's time, but they still were going off. Okay? To tell them that they must come back to the laws, statutes, and commandments. Okay? And this is the job and the duty of those who are set as watchmen. Okay? Go ahead. <clears throat> In the middle of verse 9. <clears throat> Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks. So the Most High said, Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks. Now let's go to the book of uh, 
Let's go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 9. Okay, and before you get that, let's get Isaiah 50 and 6 to see why the Most High told Ezekiel not to be afraid of the children of Israel. Okay, and this is some of the same advice we must take as watchmen, as overseers, not to be afraid of the children of Israel, not to be afraid of their hard faces, okay, and their hard heads and their impudent hearts. All right, let's get the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse. What was that, Isaiah 50 and 6? Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. It says, I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to the what? To them that plucked off, my hair, off the hair. So those that plucked off the hair. So this is actual prophecy shown of what was happening, or what would happen to Christ. Okay, to show you what the children of Israel or the spirit that's on the hard heartedness of the children of Israel, okay, or the hard headed children of Israel. He says he did what? I gave my back to the smiters. He says he gave his back to the smiters. Go ahead. And my cheeks to them that plucked and off my hair. And my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. Go ahead. I hid not my face from the shame and spitting. From and he says he hid not his face from the shame and the spitting. These are some of the things that befell our Lord and Savior Christ. Because we know that he was also sent as the shepherd, okay, the top shepherd over the children of Israel to bring them back to the fold. And what did Israel do? They rejected Christ. They scoffed. They rebuked him. They smit him. They spit on him. Okay? They made mockery of our Lord and Savior, gave him a crown of thorns. Okay? So we know that Christ says that the master or the servant is not greater than his master. So if he went through those things, we will also go through those things as shepherds. Okay? But this is giving you some examples as to why the Most High said not to be afraid of the children of Israel. Because they will try to smite you. Okay? They will spit. They will scoff. They will rebuke. They will make mockery. Okay? Go ahead. Verse 7. For the Most High will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. So he says, he will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Go ahead. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. So now we're seeing that Jeremiah also set his face as a flint. Set his face harder than the face of the children of Israel, so that he would not be confounded. Go ahead. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. That's what it means to be confounded. Okay. Let's get the book of... Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7 to get some more understanding as to why he said to make your face harder than theirs okay and then we're going to move on all right Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7 all right but the most I said make that 17 Je Salakia Jeremiah 1 17 Jeremiah 1 17 thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them so he says gird up your loins and go and arise and speak unto them. Go ahead. As I had commanded thee, be not dismayed at their faces. And be not dismayed at their faces. Don't be afraid at the faces of the children of Israel. Okay, go ahead. Lest thou confound thee before them. Lest I confound thee before them. Because if you become afraid, then I will allow you to be confounded and ashamed. Go ahead. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city. Because the Most High made Jeremiah a defensed city. Go ahead. In an iron pillar. And as an iron pillar. Go ahead. In brazen walls. And as a brazen wall. Go ahead. Against the whole land. Against the whole land. So the Most High made it so that no one can come up against Ezekiel. Okay. He made sure that the angels watched over Ezekiel in the day of his prophecy to protect him from the scoffing of the children of Israel. Okay. Go ahead. Against the kings of Judah. And against the kings of Judah. Because the kings of Judah at this time were going off. They were wicked. Okay. Going against the righteous prophets of the Most High. It came to the point where anyone who decided to separate himself from wickedness and follow the ways of the Most High became a target mm -hmm. to the nation of Israel. So the Most High had to protect his prophets to allow his word to go out. And the same thing is happening and will continue to happen in these last days with those who the Most High have set up the shepherds. 
So let's move on. Let's go to the book of First Peter, the fifth chapter, and kind of show you some more understanding on what the Bible says about eldership and shepherding. And this information that we're bringing out, this is um, pretty much a lesson for all of us. This is not us, you know, speaking out. Uh, just speaking out just to be speaking this is a lesson for all of us the scriptures tell us that uh, thou that teaches teachest thou not thyself which means when we teach we're also teaching ourselves we're also learning ourselves and this is also a call for us okay so let's go to the book of first Peter, the fifth chapter we're going to find out what the bible says about eldership okay first peter five and one go ahead first peter five and one the elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder so Peter says that the elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder go ahead and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and, Paul, and Peter was a witness of the sufferings of Christ he was a first hand witness go ahead and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed and he was promised to be a partaker of the glory that was to be revealed when was he promised? When he asked Christ, which shall we receive? Because we have forsaken all. Christ told him that all of you that have forsaken all, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, he will set up twelve seats in which the twelve disciples would sit in judgment over the children of Israel. Okay? So he was promised to partake of the glory to come. Go ahead. Verse 2. Feed the flock. So this is one of the main, if not the main purpose of an elder which is to what feed the flock of the most high which is to feed the flock of the most high and notice as I mentioned earlier that the Bible uses the example of a shepherd feeding the flock and there's a reason okay there's no mistake that the most high told our forefathers or gave our forefathers the occupation of shepherding of being sheep herders to be cattle drivers okay that particular lifestyle teaches you how to tend over sheep and that would be the same skills that you would need in order to tend over a flock okay so the same way that David was a great shepherd watched over the sheep our forefather Jacob was a shepherd Abraham Isaac and Jacob were shepherds uh, David was a great shepherd that would one day become a great ruler because a lot of the principles that are needed to rule over the people are the same principles that are needed to be a shepherd. You must feed the flock, watch over the flock. Okay, make sure the flock is protected from ravening wolves who try to creep in. These are all the duties of a watchman, of a shepherd. Go ahead. Feed the flock of the Most High which is among you. Feed the flock of the Most High which is among you. Go ahead. Taking the oversight thereof. And taking the oversight thereof. Not, okay, go ahead. Not by constraint. And not by constraint, which means it can't be something that's done by constraint. Okay, it must be done in pleasure. Okay, it must be done as your reasonable service. Okay, for the most high's sheep. Okay, or over the most high's sheep. Go ahead. But willingly. But you must do it willingly. Go ahead. Not for fil filthy lucre. And it cannot be for filthy lucre or for financial sake. Okay, it must be strictly for the purpose of making sure that the flock is tended to and fed. Okay, and it's also going to show you that it's for the purpose of providing an example. Go ahead. But of a ready mind. And it must be done of a ready mind. Go ahead. Verse 3. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. And not as being <clears throat> lords over the Most High's heritage. This is not the purpose of a shepherd. Okay, we're not set in place to be lords and rulers over the sheep of the Most High, but is what? But being examples to the flock. But being examples to the flock. Okay, being examples to the flock. And that's the purpose of eldership. That's the purpose of a shepherd. To lead the sheep in the way of righteousness, in the way that Christ left. Okay, go ahead. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. And it says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, which is Christ. He says, I am the good shepherd. Okay, so Christ is the chief shepherd over the sheep. When he shall return, go ahead. You shall receive a crown of glory. You that, shall receive a what? A crown of glory. A crown of glory. That fadeth not away. That fadeth not away. 
So the purpose of the elders is to show an example to the flock to make sure they're fed, okay, mentally, physically, and spiritually, to make sure they're fed, they're kept, okay, in order to make sure that they provide an example so that when Christ returns, they may obtain a crown of glory. Okay, that's the purpose of it. Go ahead. Verse 5, likewise you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. So it says, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. That means both physically as well as spiritually. Because the Bible tells us that when we come into this truth, we must become newborn babes in Christ. So no matter what the age may be, when you first come into this truth, you're like a newborn babe. Until the Most High raises you up, until you're suckled, and until you're reared with the sincere milk of the word. Okay? And then the Bible tells us that, uh, it says, To whom shall he teach knowledge? And to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? He that is weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Meaning you must be separated from the sincere milk of the word. And that's when the Most High can begin to use you and raise you up to be a shepherd and a leader over his flock. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, all of you, be subject one to another. And it says, be subject one to another. Go ahead. And be clothed with humility. And we must be clothed with humility. We must be humbled. Go ahead. For the Most High resisted the proud. Because the Most High resisted the proud. If you're proud, the Most High cannot use you. Go ahead. And give it grace to the humble. And give it grace to the humble. Go ahead. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of the Most High. That he may exalt you in due time. So it says, we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of the Most High, that he may exalt us in due time. So when the Most High sees fit, that it's time for you to be raised as a leader, as a watchman, as a shepherd, that's when he'll raise you up. Okay, go ahead. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. Go ahead. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may seeking whom he may devour. And we covered this a few weeks ago, showing you the persistence of Satan and the resilience of Satan, how he goes about seeking whom he may devour. And it's not like the boogeyman popping out of the closet to scare you every so often. Okay? Satan had many tricks and he had many god wiles to be able to trick you into falling into sin. Okay, he had many ways to trick you. His whole system is set up into tricking you and to getting you to fall into sin. So it's deeper than just Satan just appearing like he appeared to Christ. Okay, he will appear in many ways. So you must be sober and be vigilant. And part of the eldership is to set order in place to make sure that brothers and sisters are watched after, intended after, so that when situations do come about in which Satan tries to creep in and attack, the order and all the things that are set in place will provide a barrier and a protection for brothers and sisters who are going through spiritual struggles. Okay, go ahead. Verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the and faith. We must resist him steadfast in the faith. Go ahead. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Because we know that many of our brethren who are in the world, many of you who are in the world, are going through the same exact afflictions. Okay. Let's go to the book of uh, Exodus 18 and 13. Now we're going back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, uh, back during the time of Moses. And we're going to see how the eldership was set up in the Old Testament, coming out of the wilderness. A lot of people, when they hear the term elder, they usually think of the New Testament and the church. But this was established in the wilderness with Moses, okay, and advice that he was given by his father-in-law. So let's read this in the book of Exodus 18 and 13. Exodus 18 and 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses set to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. So the people would come to Moses to have their matters judged from morning until evening. Okay, go ahead. First and one. Moses by himself would seek to deal with the people, okay? And you're talking about millions of people, Israelites. Go ahead. Verse 14, And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? So when his father-in-law seen what Moses did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you're doing 
for all of these people. Go ahead. Why sittest thou thyself alone? Why are you sitting by yourself and judging all of these people? Go ahead. And all the people stand by thee from morning until evening. And all the people stand before you from morning until evening. From the time you get up to the time you go to sleep, there's matters to be judged. Go ahead. Verse 15. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of the Most High. Because the people are coming unto me to inquire of the Most High. To figure out knowledge of the Most High. How to deal with certain matters. Or certain matters. Okay, go ahead. Verse 16. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do. So the people would come to Moses, and he would judge between the people, between one another. Go ahead. And I do make them know the statutes of the Most High and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away. So Both. he says, what you're doing is not good, because you're going to wear away. You're going to wear away physically trying to judge all of the matters of all of these people. So we came up with some advice when he came up with a solution to help Moses judge all of the people of Israel. Go ahead. But thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. So not only are you going to wear away, but the people will also wear away. Because they only they, uh, their faith and their understanding is rested upon one man's shoulders. So if something happens to that man in which he is weary, in which he's no longer there, as the Bible tells us, when the sheep, or when the shepherd is smitten, the sheep will scatter. Okay, go ahead. But this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and the Most High shall be with thee. So he says, I will give you counsel, and the Most High shall be with you. So check out what Moses' father-in-law is telling Moses. Okay, keeping in mind that Moses was a very spiritual man, very knowledgeable. The Most High used Moses on many different levels, spoke with him mouth to mouth. But with all the knowledge and the understanding that Moses had, he still could not judge the nation of Israel by himself. Okay, that was not the job, that's not a job that one man can do. Okay, even Christ had his 12 disciples. And in the kingdom, his twelve disciples will be used to judge the nation of Israel. Okay, go ahead. Verse 20. Oh, verse, excuse me. Be thou the people, be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto the Most High. And thou shalt teach them ordinance and laws. So he says what? Start from the top of that verse where you left off. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and the Most High shall be with thee. Be thou... For the people to God ward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto the Most High. And thou shalt teach them ordinance and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. So you must teach them the ordinances and the laws. Okay, this is another purpose and another principle in which the elders must uphold to teach the people the ordinances and the laws of the Most High God. Okay? And show them the way therein in which they must walk. As we just read in First Peter's, being an example. Go ahead. Verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. So out of all the people you must choose able men. Men who are able to hold the position of shepherd or leader. Go ahead. Such as fear the most high. And men that such as fear the most high, which means to keep his commandments. Go ahead. Men of truth. Hating covetousness. And men of truth that hate of covetousness. Go ahead. And place them, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of, rulers of tens. So set up a ranking system in which you have rulers, rulers over thousands, rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, rulers over tens. And if you establish this, you will be able to properly judge the nation of Israel. Go ahead. Verse 22. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And let them judge the people at all seasons. The only thing you have to do is teach the rulers of thousands. The rulers of thousands will teach the rulers of hundreds. The rulers of hundreds will teach the rulers of fifties. The rulers of fifties will teach the rulers of tens. And they will teach the children of Israel. Okay, go ahead. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring, they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So it says every matter 
every great matter, meaning matters in which they could not handle, which they did not have, not have the aptitude to be able to deal with, they would bring it to Moses. Okay? But the smaller matters, they would deal with amongst themselves. Go ahead. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. So they shall bear the burden with thee, because it is a, a burden to judge the matters of the children of Israel. So you need a system in place, an overhead in place, and a ranking system in place that will help rule and guide the children of Israel. Not to be lords over the inheritance, not to be rulers over the inheritance, but to guide the inheritance, to be examples to the inheritance, to be... Uh, to, to give advice to the inheritance of the Most High. Okay, go ahead. Verse 23. If thou shalt do this thing, and the Most High command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Okay. So just like in the Old Testament under Moses, there was a uh, somewhat of an eldership. Uh, I guess you would call what they call today a deaconship. But back then they would have terminology such as captains, rulers, so on and so forth. The same thing was set forth in the church in the New Testament. Okay. So we're going to go to the book of First Timothy, the third chapter. It's going to give us more understanding on the position of a bishop or an elder or a leader. Go ahead. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desired a good work. So if you desire this office, you desire a good work. Because this is a good work. Go ahead. A bishop must then be blameless. So if you desire this work, you must be blameless. Go ahead. The husband of one wife. The husband of one wife. Go ahead. Vigilant. Vigilant, sober, sober, of good behavior, and of good behavior. Go ahead. Given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. You must be hospitable. Go ahead. Apt to teach. And apt to teach. You must be ready to teach. Go ahead. As the Bible says, ready to give answer to every man. Go ahead. Verse 3. Not given to wine. Go ahead. You can't be a drunkard. No striker. Nor a striker. You can't be abusive. Go ahead. Not greedy of filthy lucre. And you cannot be greedy of filthy lucre. You can't be somebody who's out just to get money. Go ahead. But patient. But you must be patient. Okay, go ahead. Not a brawler. Not a brawler. A person who's known for scuffling and fighting for no apparent reason. Okay, or you may have a disagreement and you now you're ready to fight and scuffle. Okay, you can't have that type of spirit. Go ahead. Not covetous. And you cannot be covetous. Go ahead. One that ruled well his own house. And you must... Rule well over your own house. Go ahead. Having his children in subjection with and, all gravity. And if you have children, then they must be in subjection with all gravity. Go ahead. For if a man know not how to rule his own house. Because if you cannot rule your own house, go ahead. How shall he take the care? How, how shall he take care of the of the church of the Most High? It'll be impossible for you to take care of the church of the Most High. Go ahead. Not a novice. And you cannot be a novice, spiritual novice. Go ahead. Which in the Greek is a neophyte, which means a new convert, okay, a newly converted person. Go ahead. That's being lifted up with pride. He fall into condemnation of the devil. Because dealing with a person who's a novice, being lifted up with pride, they will fall into condemnation of the devil. Okay, go ahead. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach. In the snare of the devil. Okay. And it says he must have a good report with those that are without. So not only must you have a good report with those who are amongst the body, also amongst those that are without. Those who are not necessarily in the truth, but those who you may deal with on a basis, or those you may come across in your comings and goings. You must have a good report with these people. Okay. And it tells us about how those who don't have a good report, how they blaspheme the name of the Most High by misrepresenting the Most High, okay, amongst those that are without. Go ahead. Verse 8, likewise must the deacons be grave. So it says, likewise must the deacons be grave. So then it also goes into the uh, 
the principles or the requirements of a deacon. All right. Let's jump to the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 1. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers So it says let every soul be subject unto the higher powers We're going to find out that these powers It's talking about the power that the Most High set in the church It tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter That governments were actually set within the church Amongst those who are elders, deacons, who the Bible calls bishops Those who are in a position of overseer Okay, it is similar to a government Go ahead. For there is no power but of the Most High. The powers that be are ordained of the Most High. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of the Most High. And they, shall, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. The rule, for rulers are not a terror to the good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the powers? Okay. And the rulers is speaking about are the overseers. Okay. Like it tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, the 12th verse. As a matter of fact, let's read that real quick. In the Old Testament. Uh, Deuteronomy 17 and 12. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 12. And the man that will do presumptuously. And a man that will do presumptuously. Okay, which means a man that will go in his own mind, with his own understanding. And do something according to his own will. Go ahead. And will not hearken unto the priest. And will not hearken unto the priest. Go ahead. That standeth to minister therefore, there before the Most High thy power. The one that stands before to minister to the Most High power. Go ahead. Or unto the judge. Even that man shall die. Even that man shall die. Go ahead. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. And you shall put away the evil from Israel. So in the Old Testament it tells you. That they who did not follow the priests who at that time were the leaders and the teachers of Israel, those who did not follow were to die, that the evil may be put out of Israel. Okay, so let's go back to the book of Romans, the 13th chapter. Okay. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Now some people may say, well, if there's a, a government body set up within the church, uh, does that mean that we are to disannul and not acknowledge the government that's set in this world. Okay? And the answer is no. And I'm going to tell you what I mean when I say that. Okay? When I say, shall you disannul and altogether not deal with the uh, government of this world, what I mean is this. For example, there's a law in this world, in this, in this system, that if you run a red light, you get a ticket. Okay? There's red lights, some people may call them red robots, at the end of every street to let you know when your car can go and when your car needs to stop. Now, if you break and forsake that law, what happens? You get in an accident. Okay? Just to show you common sense of how there are actually laws within this earth that we must follow, even in the places of our captivity. Because often we hear people say, well, you know, is it okay, you know, the people stole from us, Are we? Able, well, is it okay for us to steal from the nations? Is it okay for us to do certain things under this present government, being that this government is wicked? And the answer is no. The Bible says you still must be blameless, not only amongst those that are in the truth, but those who are without. Okay? So you can't try to come to the truth or come to amongst the body and try to be a saint, but then you leave and you run and have it through the city under the auspices or the guys that well this is not crisis government this ain't the church government so I ain't got to follow the rules of the society okay this does not disregard the rules that are set in place under this current government okay go ahead Romans chapter 13 verse 3 for rulers are not a terror to good works go ahead but to the evil Will thou then not be afraid of the power do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same for he, is a, for he is the minister of the Most High. And it says he is the minister of the Most High. Now, if someone in this, if this government tells you to accept a vaccine which will damage your health, that's a different story. 
If they tell you to take a microchip, which the Bible tells you not to take, that's a different story. Okay? If it tells you to accept a lifestyle which the Bible is against, that's a different story. Okay? But if the law is not unto death, okay, if it's something as simple as not stealing from the society, not stealing from their stores, not running their red lights and things of that nature, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unto death. You're not breaking the laws of God. Okay? And that's just more to just to show you the difference between the government of Christ and the government of this world. Yes, we are accountable to the government of Christ, but due to our captivity and the sins of our forefathers, we're also accountable to some degree to the government of this earth. Okay, this is part of our punishment. Go ahead. Verse 4. For he is the minister of the Most High, to do thee, to thee for good, excuse me. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bear it so not. if you do that which is evil, then be afraid. Okay, go ahead. For he bear it not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of the Most High, a revenge, okay. a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Okay, and that's in both in the truth and to some degree that it operates in the world. Okay, because a lot of things happen to people in the world with the authorities in the world because they do things that they have no business. Okay. And when something happens, they like to put it off as they're being persecuted or something is happening to them and they're suffering for the sake of Christ. But what's really happening is you're being judged for something you're doing. Okay? And the Most High is trying to turn you the right way. Okay? So, not only is there judgment within the church, there's also judgments that go out within this government. Okay? The Most High may put the Spirit on someone who's in authority to do something to you based on something you're doing against the Most High and that you need to change. Okay? As a matter of fact, let's get the book of uh, let's get the book of uh, Isaiah the 10th chapter. Okay? To show you how the Most High uses the governments of this earth as a whipping tool or a whipping stick against evil. Okay? Uh, let's start at maybe verse 7. Let's try uh, Isaiah 10 and 7. Uh, let's start at verse 5. Uh, Isaiah 10 and 5. Okay, to show you how the Most High actually uses the nations and the governments of this earth for punishment. Okay, for the Most High's punishment. Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. So it says, O Assyrian, the what? The rod of my anger. The rod of mine anger. So the Most High is using the Assyrian as the rod of his anger, as his tool of punishment. Okay, go ahead. In the staff, in their hand, a, is in the, excuse me, in the staff, in their hand is mine indignation. And the staff in his hand is my indignation. So the Most High uses the Assyrian as a rod and a staff in his hand for indignation, to beat his children. Go ahead. I will send him against a hypocritical nation. And he will send him against a hypocritical nation. That's the nation of Israel. We were being hypocrites. We were hypocritical. Go ahead. And against the people of my wrath. And against the people of my wrath, the children of Israel. Go ahead. Will I give him a charge to take the spoil? Go ahead. And to take the prey. And to tread down and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Go ahead. How be it? He, he mean it not so, neither doeth his heart think so. But it is in And him. it says, He meaneth not so, neither doeth his heart think so, which means the Assyrian don't even know that he's being used by the Most High. Okay? It says, It's not in his heart, neither do he think so. He just thinks he's going throughout the earth and taking down the earth. You don't even realize that he's being used by the Most High as a whipping stick. Okay, and the same thing happens in the earth today. Okay, the nations and the governments are used as a whipping stick. But the Bible is going to show you what happens when they now disregard the power that sets them up and gives them the power to be the whipping stick. Go ahead. How be it? He mean it not so. Neither do it his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. Go ahead. For he said... Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not king. So he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? So this is now the boastfulness of the king of Assyria after the Most High have raised them up. This is what happens with the kings of the nations. Okay? The Most High raised them up to power, 
and they get boastful. They think it's by their power, their strength, their might that they are lifted up to be a whipping stick over the earth. Go ahead. Verse 9. It's not Kelno as Carchemish. It's not Hamid as Ar Arpad. It's not Samaria as Damascus. Okay, so now he's comparing all of the lands of the other nations that he subdued and saying, are they not like the cities of my country? Okay, or the cities of my empire. Go ahead. Verse 10. And my hand have found the kingdoms of the idols. And my hand have found the kingdoms of the idols, meaning the kingdoms of the Gentiles, the other nations. Go ahead. And whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. Go ahead. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do I to Jerusalem and her idols. So the same thing that I have done to Samaria and her idols, I shall do the same thing to Jerusalem and her idols. Okay, so he's boasting. But the Most High is going to put him in check. Go ahead. Verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. So after he uses the Assyrian as the whipping stick to bruise and to beat and correct the children of Israel, he's now going to turn his wrath against the Assyrian. The same thing is going to happen today. The Most High set the nations up as a whipping stick against the nation of Israel. And once it's all said and done, he will then turn his wrath against the nations. Go ahead. And the glory of his high looks. And the glory of his high looks. Go ahead. Verse 13. For he said, by the strength of my hand have I, have I done it. So he believes by the strength of his own hand he have taken down the nations, that he would destroy Jerusalem. Go ahead. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Because he thinks he's wise, he's smart, he's intelligent enough to take down the nations. When the Bible says it could have not been done except the Lord have allowed it. Go ahead. And I have removed the bounds of the people. And he have removed the bounds of the people. He thinks that is by his power. Go ahead. And have robbed their treasures. And I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. Go ahead. And my hand have found as a nest the riches of the people. So he says his hands have found as a nest the riches of a people. Like a person can easily take eggs from a bird's nest. That's how easy he took the treasures of the nations, and he thought it was by his power. Go ahead. And as one gathered eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeled or peeped, excuse me. Go ahead. Verse 15. So there was none that was able to stop me, in other words. Go ahead. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? So now the axe begins to boast itself against the one that heweth therewith. It's like you chopping wood with the axe, and now the axe boasts of itself as if it's by its power that it's able to chop the wood. Okay? The axe is just a weapon. The hewer has the power. The Most High is the hewer. The Assyrian is the axe. The governments and the powers of this earth today, right now, are just the axe. The Most High is the hewer. Go ahead. Or shall a saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? So it's like a saw boasting itself against the one who saws a tree. When he's just a tool, he's just a weapon that's being used to saw. Okay, you have the power. The same way the Most High has the power over these nations and to use them as a weapon. That's what he's doing. Okay, go ahead. As if the rod should shake itself against them that it lifted it up. Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were not wood. So like the staff, it's like you're raising up a staff and now that staff think it's powerful. The staff think it's by its might that it's being raised up. But you're the one that got the arm. You're the one that has the power and the strength to lift up the staff. Okay? That's the power that resides with the Most High over the nations. To use them as tools and as weapons to beat his people. Now, how does this go back to what we just read? Dealing with eldership. This is just giving you an example showing you that not only is there judgment amongst the body of Christ that the Most High sets in place. The Most High also uses the nations and their governments and their powers, their authorities to set judgment in place. To whip, beat, and get the children of Israel into order. Okay, go ahead. Verse 16. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness. <clears throat> okay, so he's going to plague all the possessions of the king of Assyria. He's going to send to his fat ones leanness. Okay, send famines. Go ahead. And under his glory he shall kindle a burning. Okay, so let's go back to Romans. The, as a matter of fact, let's go to... Uh, Sirach 7 and 29. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let's speed this thing up. Alright, Sirach 
7 and 29 okay and this is going back into reference with the book of Romans the 13th chapter to show you what it means about the priest being set in order and being set over the church or the elders and overseers being set over the church okay for judgment okay righteous judgment okay uh, Sirach 7 and 29 Sirach chapter 7 verse 29 fear the most high with all thy soul fear the Lord with all your soul go ahead and re reverence his priest and it says reverence his priest okay as we just read in Deuteronomy 17 and 12 any man who presumptuously which means purposely will go against the priest of the most high shall die okay go ahead love them love him that made thee with all thy strength and forsake not his ministers and forsake not his ministers go ahead fear the most high and honor the priest and give him his portion as it is commanded thee the okay. first that's similar to what we read in the book of Romans 13 okay fear the Lord and honor the priest it's just using different terminologies go ahead and give him his portion as it is commanded thee the first fruits and the trespass offering okay because when you go to the book of Romans 13 it speaks about giving the tributes in the Old Testament it was first fruits it was offerings of fruit and your increase okay today we don't have increase we don't have sheep, cattle and goats and things of that nature okay so your what you earn is sent to those who are laboring ministers okay go ahead in the gift of the shoulders or per, let me let me rephrase that a percentage of what you earn is sent to those ministers because you have a lot of scoffers and a lot of people who you know put out all types of things so I like to just make that correct and distinct okay go ahead and the sacrifice of sanctification go ahead and the first fruits of the holy things okay let's go to first Timothy's 5 and 17 Okay, uh, let's go to you there, first Timothy five and seventeen. Okay, go ahead. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So the Bible says let the elders that rule well be counted uh, worthy of double honor. Okay, go ahead. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay, go ahead. For the scripture said Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn. Because the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, even with the animals, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treaded the corn. Okay? So are not men better than the ox? Okay, go ahead. And the labor is worthy of his reward. And the labor is worthy, worthy of his reward. Like Christ told his disciples, the workman is worthy of his hire. Go ahead. Verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation so it says not to receive an accusation against an elder so this is now instruction to the younger men and those of the church and how to treat and deal with an elder okay go ahead but before two or three witnesses so it says receive not an ac accusation but before two or three witnesses okay and that have always been the case from old testament to new testament two or three witnesses let everything be established okay uh, first peters 2:15 okay and we're almost uh, we're drawn to a close or we're almost drawn to a close okay first Peter 2 25 first Peter chapter 2 verse 25 for ye were as sheep going astray so we were as sheep going astray okay ye were as sheep going astray go ahead but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls and you're now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of of your souls which is Christ okay so let's go to 1 Peter 2.25 you did that? yeah 1 Peter 2.25 so lock it 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 15 so lock it 1 Peter 2.15 for so is the will of the Most High, that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So when you read the full context of this particular scripture, speaking about being, uh, once again going into that same understanding of being blameless amongst those that are with and those that are without. Okay? 
So he says, For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Okay, go ahead. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. And as free, not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. Such you know what we were talking about earlier. We have liberty in Christ. Okay, but we cannot use that liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. Using it for our own gain, our own lust. Okay, go ahead. But as the servants of the Most High. But as servants of the Most High. Go ahead. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear the Most High. Honor the King. Go ahead. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the fro. Okay, so back then in the church, you had those who had indentured servants. And they were told to obey their masters. Okay? Now we know this was used in slavery as a scripture that they twisted and gave a misconception and uh, misquoted the scripture to tell the slaves to try to uh, get the slaves to honor their so-called slave masters or their slave masters. But this scripture don't have anything to do with how it was used in slavery. Okay, it's dealing with indentured servants who were told to honor and serve their masters. Okay, when you read the book of Philemon, that's, that's one of them. Okay, that's a perfect example when you read that book of Philemon. Go ahead. Verse 19. For this is thank for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards the most high endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Okay. So it says it's thankworthy if a man for conscience toward the most high endure grief and suffer wrongfully. Because even Christ himself suffered wrongfully. So it's not a shameful thing to suffer wrongfully. Go ahead. Verse 20. For what glory is that it? means being <laughs> judged or being something being executed against you for something that you may have not done. Okay, a false accusation may have been done, you may have been scolded, you may have been judged to a degree based on that particular situation. But the Bible says that it's not, it's a, it's a, uh, a thing of honor to be judged wrongfully or to be, uh, to be, read that again, to suffer wrongfully, Salakia. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. Verse 20, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults. So what glory do you have if you be corrected for your faults? Go ahead. Ye shall take it patiently. Ye shall take it patiently. Go ahead. But if then, but if when ye were but if you But when you do well excuse me. But if you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with the most high. Okay, so also not only when you do wrong and are judged, not only be patient in that sense, but also when you do right and you're judged wrongfully. You must also take it patiently in that sense, okay? Because this is honorable in the sight of the Most High. Go ahead. Verse 21. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for Because this is what you were called to. You were called to a work in which you're going to suffer wrongfully for many things. You're going to be judged improperly. You're going to be judged wrongfully for many things. You're going to be scolded for many things wrongfully, okay? But this is part of this work. Go ahead. Read that last part because Christ. For, for even here unto were you called because Christ also suffered for us. Because even Christ suffered for us. How did Christ suffer? It's going to show you. Go ahead. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And he left us an example that we may follow his steps. And it's our duty as elders, leaders, and those that are set up as watchmen to provide that example for the flock. To, to provide that example for the sheep. Okay? That they may know how to walk in the love and the guidance of Christ and the law, statutes, and commandments of Christ. Go ahead. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Because Christ did no sin and no God was found in his mouth. Go ahead. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. And he was reviled. Think about this. A perfect man did no sin. Came to save his people. Tell them that a kingdom is at hand. It's time for them to rule. He's the sacrifice that will redeem them from all of their sins of their forefathers. And he was rejected, reviled, okay? Beaten, mocked, spit on, given a crown of thorns, crucified, okay? Go ahead. When he suffered, he threatened not. When he suffered, he threatened not. Go ahead. But committed himself. Think not that I'm able to call 12 legions out of heaven, okay? And when he said, uh, what else did he say? He said that if this was my kingdom, then would my servants fight. Okay, but he understood it was not time. So he took it cheerfully, understanding his purpose. Go ahead. 
but committed himself to him that judges righteously. But he committed himself to him that judges right, righteously, which is the Most High. Go ahead. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on that tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by who, by whose stripes you are healed. By whose stripes you are healed, as it is prophesied in Isaiah 53. Okay, by his hanging on the cross, by his body being hung on the tree and him suffering crucifixion, we were healed. Okay, so imagine if Christ decided that when the people came against him, to now go and rebuke, okay, to, to deal spitefully, to now threaten, to now do the things unto others that were done unto him. Would we then have a sacrifice for our sins? But we have a way in which we can now go back to the Father for a, a means of repentance. Okay? We wouldn't have that if Christ decided to now go off his own and do his own thing and threaten and do all those different things. So we have to keep that in mind when, it's, when it comes to us. Okay? We are not our own. The Bible says that we are bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. Okay? We were bought with Christ's blood. So we must walk the same way he walked. We can't be threatening, reviling, and rebuking and things of that nature. Okay, we must walk using the same example that Christ gave us, taking, uh, taking uh, persecution cheerfully and suffering wrongfully. Go ahead. Verse twenty-five. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returning to the shepherd. And because we were sheep going astray, who were the sheep going astray? The nation of Israel. But now we are returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of our souls, which is Christ. Okay. Let's go to the Apocrypha, chapter 7, verse 24. Here's just some wisdom scriptures, a few wisdom scriptures that the Bible gives you in conducting yourself amongst uh, an elder, okay? This is Sirach 7 and 24. Sirach, chapter 7, verse 24. Has thou daughters? Uh, 7 and 14, Salakia. Sirach 7 and 14. Sirach, chapter 7, verse 14. Use not many words in the multitude of elders. So the Bible says use not many words in the multitude of elders. Okay, go ahead. And make not much babbling when thou prayest. And make not thou much babbling when thou prayest. So what does this mean? Let's hold this real quick and go to the book of uh, Ecclesiastes in the Bible, chapter 5. Okay? Ecclesiastes 5 in the Bible. Alright, please ask these five and one. Go ahead. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of the Most High. Keep your foot. Watch yourself when you go into the house of the Most High. Go ahead. And be more ready to hear. Be more ready to hear. Be more ready to listen. Go ahead. <clears throat> then to give the sacrifice of fools. Then to give the sacrifice of a fool. Go ahead. For they consider not that they do evil. Because they consider not that they do evil. By what? By what we just read in the book of Sirach 7 and 14, using much words in the multitude of elders. Okay, go ahead. Verse 2, be not rash with thy mouth. Be not rash with your mouth. Go ahead. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before the Most High. And don't let your mind be hasty to utter anything before the Most High. And it's also, when you read down, it's going to go into giving bombs and making oaths before the Most High. Making an oath that you can't keep. Okay, it also goes into that as you read down. Okay, so let's go back to the book of Sirach, and we're going to jump to Sirach 8 and 8. Okay? Sirach chapter 8, verse 8. Despise not the discourse of the wise. So the Bible says, discourse not, or despise not the discourse of the wise. Go ahead. But acquaint thyself with, the, with their proverbs. And make yourself known, make yourself well acquainted with their proverbs. Go ahead. For of them thou shalt learn instruction. Because of them thou shalt learn instruction. Go ahead. And how to serve great men with ease. And how to serve great men with ease. Okay, go ahead. Miss not the discourse of the elders. And it says, miss not the discourse of the elders. So this is that wise discourse that it mentions in the 8th verse. Okay, miss not the discourse of elders. Go ahead. For they also learn of their fathers. Because they also learn of their fathers, whether physical or spiritual fathers. Okay, go ahead. And of them thou shalt learn understanding. And of them thou shalt learn understanding. Go ahead. And to give answer as needed required. And to give answer as need requireth. Okay, that's where you're going to learn the understanding of how to speak, how to give answer according to scripture, how to become a leader. Okay, that's where you're going to receive it by not missing the discourse of the elders. Okay, 
Let's get Hebrews 13 and 17. Okay, and we're almost drawing to a close. All right, we got a few more to cover. Okay, Hebrews 13 and 17. Now, we mentioned earlier, we went over the scripture that went into the servants obeying their masters. And we went into how they had indentured servants back in the time of the New Testament. Okay, but also those who are uh, in the church or those that were in the church were seen as servants of those who were the watchmen or overseers okay and it's going to show you Hebrews 13 and 17 obey them that have rule over you so the Bible says obey them that have rule over you go ahead and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls and it says submit yourselves for they watch for your souls and that's the quintessential uh, purpose of an elder okay to watch over your souls. Go, go ahead. As they that must give account. Because they must give an account. Go ahead. That they must that they may do it with joy. That they may do it with joy. Go ahead. And not with grief. And not with grief. Go ahead. For that is unprofitable for you. Because for you that is unprofitable. Go ahead. Pray for us. For we must for we trust we have a good conscience in all things. So it says you must pray for those. Who the Most High have set in position. Okay, pray for us. All right. Like Paul will always mention to pray for me that a door of utterance may be opened. Okay, pray for the health. Pray for the uh, guidance. Pray for the safety. Pray for the Most High open up a door of understanding, so that the elders may be guided in understanding by the Most High that they may be able to guide you properly. Okay, these are the things that the flock prays for when it comes to the elders. Okay, go ahead. Willing to live honestly. And willing to live honestly. That we may have good of conscience to all things or in all things, willing to live honestly. Let's get James 5 and 13. James chapter 5 verse 13. Okay. Is any among you afflicted? So it says, is any among you afflicted? Okay, go ahead. Let him pray. Are you going through sorrow, pain, suffering, affliction, lamentation? Go ahead. Let him pray. Let him pray. Is any merry? Is any merry? Is any happy? Is any joyful in the spirit? Go ahead. Let him sing psalms. Let him sing psalms. Go ahead. So there's nothing wrong with music according to the Bible. Music that is of a righteous representation. Okay, go ahead. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Is anyone sick among you? Go ahead. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him call for the elders of the church. Go ahead. And let them pray over him. And let them pray over him for what? Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Anointing of him with oil in the name of Yeshua. And we covered this last week. Going into spiritual health according to the Bible. Or healing according to the Bible. This is one of the principles of healing that was set forth in the church. Okay, go ahead. Verse 15. And a prayer of the faith shall save the sick. And a prayer of faith shall save the sick. Okay? So it takes faith not only on the side of the elder, the person who's praying over you. It also takes faith from the person who's being prayed on. Christ often told those who were healed that by your faith were ye made whole. By your faith were ye healed. And then there was times in which he went into a city and did many miracles but could not heal because the people did not believe. They didn't have faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it takes faith on both parts. Go ahead. And that faith, as we read last week, cannot be built but by much prayer and fasting. Okay, go ahead. And the most I shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Go ahead. Confess your faults one to another. And this is another form of healing, confessing our faults one to another. Go ahead. And pray for one another. And pray for one another. And the psychologists and the psych, uh, psychiatric and the uh, I guess you would call the shrinks of the society have capitalized off of this principle off of this scripture uh, confessing your thoughts one to another okay go ahead that ye may be healed that ye may be healed because there's healing that comes with speaking and allowing your thoughts to come out it's like vomiting up uh, something that's been plaguing you Okay, something that have made you sick. Okay, that's that's the uh, example of confessing your faults. 
Okay, go ahead. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So it has much weight with the Most High. Okay, the prayer of the righteous. It has much weight with the Most High. The Most High will carry it out like Christ told Peter. Uh, anything that you shall agree on touching in this earth shall be bound in heaven. Or anything that you have bound in earth shall be bound in heaven. Okay, anything that you agree on in earth will be agreed on in heaven. Okay, that's the power that the Most High have set with those that he have given positions over his flock. Okay, over his sheep. That's it on that? Mm -hmm. Alright, let's, let's go back to Sirach, chapter 37, verse 16. Okay, so Rock 37 and 16. We're almost finished. Just a few more references and that'll be it. Okay, so Rock 37, 16. Right, let reason go before every enterprise. So the Bible says let reason go before every enterprise. Okay, so everything you seek to establish, everything you seek to embark on, let reason go before it. Go ahead. And counsel before every action. And let counsel go before every action. So this is another reason in why the, or as to why the eldership and leadership is set into place. To make sure that advice and counsel is there for those who need it. Okay? And it says, let reason go before every enterprise and counsel before every action. You want to make sure that your enterprises and anything you're trying to establish is well reasoned, well spoke about, well counseled, and prayed over, and sent up to the Most High to receive proper understanding as to how you should go about whatever your enterprise may be. Okay? Romans 12 and 7. Okay, Romans 12 and 7. Okay? Now this is for those who are looking and seeking, as we read earlier, the Bible told us that uh, any man that seeks to be an elder or seeks to be a bishop have, uh, have required a good work or, or seek for good work, okay? But for those who are seeking that good work, uh, here's another principle that the Bible gives us, telling us that we must be patient before we are raised. The Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly, meaning don't give any man a position suddenly. Every man must be tried according to the spirit, according to faith and understanding. Okay? So the Bible is going to give us some advice when it comes to those who are waiting for that position. Okay? Go ahead. Romans chapter 12, verse 7. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. So you must be patient and, and wait on your ministry. Wait till you are ex exalted to now carry out your ministry. Don't rush it. Okay? Because if you rush it and try to do it on your own power, your own wisdom, your own might, it will not work. Okay? It must be established and set up by the Most High. Okay? Go ahead. Or he that teach it on teaching. And if you're seeking to be a teacher, you must wait until you are anointed and set to be a teacher. Okay, go ahead. Or he that exhort it on exhortation. He that exhort it on exhortation. Go ahead. He that give it, let him do it with simplicity. And he that give it, let him give it with simplicity. Okay, one-mindedness, not being uh, double-minded in giving. Okay, go ahead. He that rule it with diligence. He that show it mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Go ahead. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Go ahead. Be kindly affectionate one to another. And these are all the principles we must have as leaders, as elders, as brothers and sisters, man. Uh, love. Okay? Letting it, not letting love uh, uh, dissipate. Okay? Or letting your love go with dissimulation. Okay? Letting ourselves wax cold towards one another. You must keep love for one another and that's the key thing that's why Christ told us that the two greatest commandments is to love the most high with all our, all our hearts all our uh, minds and all our might and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves okay love is the key factor that's going to let all things and allow all things to grow in the ministry of the most high Christ okay without love this thing cannot go on okay you can't feel the hurt of the people like Jeremiah said, I am hurt for the hurt of my people. But there's no way you can feel the hurt of the people if you don't love the people. 
Okay? So we must love one another, not only those in position, but those who are amongst the flock. We must love one another. Go ahead. Verse 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another. And we must be kindly affectionate. Okay? Affectionate. Go ahead. With brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Not slothful in business. Okay? So this is not a game. Like any business, if you're in business in this world, you must make sure you're on top of your game. But what happens? You get fired. Well, guess what? Same thing happens with the Most High's ministry. If you're slothful, you will get fired. Okay? And uh, the worst thing, like the Bible says, is a horrible thing. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the Most High. It's the worst thing to be fired from the Most High's business. So we must make sure that we're not slothful in business. Go ahead. Fervent in, in the spirit. It must be fervent in the spirit. Go ahead. Serving the Most High. Serving the Lord. Go ahead. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in, tri patient in tribulation. Patient in tribulation. Go ahead. <clears throat> Continuing instant in prayer. And we, that's the key thing. Being patient in tribulation. Because much tribulation will come. Okay. Much things are going to come. It's going to rock the boat. Many things are going to come. It's going to throw you off. Make you full a certain type of way. But you got to be patient. Okay. You must be patient. Go ahead. Continuing instant in prayer. Continuing instant in prayer. Being in continual prayer. Okay, that's another thing. That's our only connection we got to the Most High. Prayer. Okay? So we must do that so that we can receive guidance, understanding, and uh, love from the Spirit of the Most High. Okay? Uh, Amos 7 and 14. Amos chapter 7 verse 14 Then answered Amos And said to Amaziah I was no prophet Neither was I a prophet's son But I was an herdman You see what Amos says He says that I was no prophet Neither was I a prophet's son But I was an herdman But we know the Most High Used Amos as a prophet And as a shepherd Over the nation of Israel Okay, so he didn't have any astounding accreditations or credentials of a prophet or a prophet's son. Okay, he was a simple herdman that the Most High used as a prophet over his people. Go ahead. And a gatherer of a sycamore fruit. And get a gatherer of the sycamore fruit. Go ahead. And the Most High took me as I followed the flock. And the Most High took me as I followed the flock. Go ahead. And the Most High said unto me, Go. Prophesy unto my people Israel. Go and prophesy to my people Israel. Okay, so the prophethood of the Most High is not what you see being established through the theologian seminary colleges or any university of this earth. The Most High takes the lowest of the low, the humblest of the humble, and the meek, meekest of the meek, and he uses them to be prophets and leaders. Okay, same way he did to Amos, same way he did to Moses. Moses had a speech impediment. Okay, couldn't even speak well, but the Most High used him as a leader to guide his people. Okay, just a few examples. David, another one. Okay, a very young man with the Bible considers to be a, what we would consider today, a handsome man. Okay, a shepherd, very young man, but the Most High used him and raised him up as a warrior and a leader and a shepherd over the children of Israel. Okay, these are all the examples these are all examples that still exist for today. The Bible tells us that the things that were written before time were written for our learning. So we must learn from these things and see how the Most High used those who are of humble origin or humble beginnings. Okay? Christ himself, very humble, very meek. The most humblest, most meekest man to ever walk the face of the earth. The Most High used him. Okay? To come into this earth to bring salvation for the children of Israel and to lead them back to the Father. Okay? So you don't have to be, you know, if someone went through a theologian seminary college, I don't have anything against that. Uh, if someone went through a university of this earth, I don't have anything against that. But what we're saying is that that's not what determines who the Most High uses. Okay? Let's get the book of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Okay? And let's start maybe at verse 13. Let's 
Salakia. Let's jump down to let's see, First Corinthians. And let's go to verse 25. 25 to 26. Matter of fact, 27. Go ahead. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. Because the foolish of the most because the foolishness of the most high is wiser than men. Because the foolishness of the most high is wiser than men. Go ahead. And the weakness of the most high is stronger than men. And the weakness of the most high is stronger than men. You can take the wisest, most intelligent man on the face of the earth on his best day. And he won't be able to compete with the most high's intelligence and wisdom on his worst day. Hmm. Okay? And they're going to show you what it means about when it says the foolishness of the most high. It's not saying that the most high is foolish, but the most high used something what the world considers foolish to confound the wisdom of this world. Go ahead. Verse 26. For ye, see, for ye see your calling. So we see our calling. Brethren. You see your calling, brethren. Go ahead. How that not many wise men after the flesh. Not many wise men after the flesh. Meaning those who are wise according to this world. Okay, you don't see many so-called wise men of this earth come into the truth of Christ. Go ahead. Not many mighty, not many noble. Not many mighty, not many so-called mighty men of this earth or according to this earth. You don't see them often in the truth. Go ahead. Not many noble. And not many noble, not many of those who are considered to be nobles, magistrates and leaders of this earth. Rarely do you see those people come past the truth or come and deal in the truth. Why? Go ahead. Verse 27. But the Most High had chosen the foolish things of this world. He had chosen the foolish things of this world. This is what it means by the foolishness of the Most High. He chose the foolish things of this world. Those who don't have the accreditation, the credentials, those who have not been through the universities, who don't have the scholarship and the high level intelligence according to this world. They are those who the Most High uses. Okay, and they're the foolish of this world, but he uses the foolish things to do what? To confound the wise. To confound the wise. Go ahead. And the Most High had chosen the weak things of the world. And he chose the weak things of the world. Go ahead. To confound the things that are mighty. And to confound the things that are mighty. Go ahead. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised. And the base things of the world, and the things that are despised. Who's more based and more despised than the children of Israel coming out of captivity? But yet, these same people are used to confound the wisest, most intelligent, so-called scholars of this earth. Okay? Go ahead. Hath the Most High chosen. And the Most High chose them to do so. Go ahead. Yeah. And the things which are not, to, to bring to not the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his, in his presence. That, and he does it so that no flesh may glory in his presence. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a problem with those who may have those accreditations, who may have those particular credentials according to this world. But the Bible tells us that the Most High have made it so that no man may glory in his flesh. Even Paul makes mention of how he had many things to boast after in the flesh, being an Israelite, knowing his heritage, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, raised in the strictest sect of the law, being raised a Pharisee, but yet all those things that made him of something according to men, he accounted nothing for Christ. He accounted them loss. Okay, why? Because they meant nothing. All right. Only through Christ are we magnified. That's where we get our glory from, through Christ. Not from our own wisdom, our own knowledge, our own strength, and our own understanding. Only through Christ. Okay, so let's go back to where we just left off in the book of Amos 7 to 14 and 15. We're going to read that again. Okay. Amos chapter 7 verse 14. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of, and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. So Amos was a herdman and a gatherer of the sycamore fruit. He was a humble man who came from humble beginnings okay what this world would consider the low of the earth all right go ahead in what glory does the former have in his earth or herdmen have in his earth even though they provide some of the food and some of the delicacies that we may consume they get little to no glory or regard okay even in our time but yet the most high uses the herdmen and those who are of low estate to confound the things of the wise. 
so that no man can glory and say that it was of his wisdom that he brought the children of Israel back to the Father. It was of his wisdom that he was able to break down the scriptures so well. Okay, You have brothers who were illiterate, couldn't read in the world, but came into the knowledge of the Most High and became eloquent speakers. Okay, Could read very well. Okay, Can speak very well. You have that. The Most High will use that Okay, and raise that up. He did the same thing with Amos. Go ahead. Verse 15. And the Most High took me as I followed the flock. And the Most High said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. And he says, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Okay, go and prophesy to my people Israel. And the Most High is seeking to do the same thing with you, to raise you up, to make you become leaders, to confound the foolishness of this world, or the wisdom of this world, which is really foolishness to the Most High. Okay, this is what we're being called for. Not just as elders, not just as deacons, not just as those in position, but as a nation. Okay, this is what we're being called to do. Our whole life existence is to confound the foolishness of this world. Okay, or the wisdom of this world. Go ahead. Verse 16. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Most High. So now hear the words of the Most High. Not as, it, not as from Amos and his intelligence, but as it was given to Amos from the Most High. Okay, let's go to the book of Romans 12 and 4. Romans chapter 12 verse 4 For as we have many members in one body And all members have not the same office So we being many are one body in Christ So there's many members to this body Okay, or this body Salakia Okay, there's many members There's not just elders There's not just deacons There's not just bishops There's not just those who have offices There are many members of this body Okay, many Go ahead. And every one members one of another. And it says, let's go back to verse 4, that last part of verse 4, and all members. And all members have not the same office. And all members have not the same office. So all members of the body of Christ will not be elders, all will not be deacons, all will not be bishops, all will not be teachers. Okay? The same way all will not be uh, herdsmen, because a nation needs herdsmen. Okay? All will not be blacksmiths. A nation needs blacksmiths. Builders, carpenters, okay? A, a nation needs those who are ambassadors, scholars who can actually go out and speak uh, to nations or operate as an ambassador, okay? There's many things that a nation needs outside of teachers. The elders, they're only uh, set in place as uh, those who lead the flock as examples to show us the way of Christ, okay? And to keep the flock fed and to make sure the flock is tended after. That's the purpose of the elders. But as a nation, okay, as a nation of people, there's many offices, there's many uh, parts of this body that are needed to help build a nation, okay? The elders are just putting the word out there to gather those people together. Or well, the Most High is using those who are in position to speak to gather everyone together to help build a nation, okay? But there are many members to this body. Go ahead. Having then gifts differing from one another, <clears throat> differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy. So it says, so we being many are one body in Christ. So there's many of us, but we're all one body in Christ, and every one members of another. No matter how low you think your position is or your value is, you're still a part of the body of Christ. Okay? Try telling your pinky toe that it's of no value. And that you don't need your pinky toe. Try cutting it off. See how well do you walk after you cut off that pinky toe. Okay? Try cutting off your small finger. Okay? Thinking that it's one of the smallest, or oh, it is the smallest finger on your hand. Try cutting it off and operating without this finger. See how well you use this hand. Okay? Just to give you an example of how the smallest parts of the body are still highly regarded and are still needed. Okay? Go ahead. Verse 6, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to and us. And everyone have gifts that differ according to the grace that is given. According to the measure of, of grace and faith that the Most High have given you, that's the gift that you will have to bring to the body. Whether it's 
considered small or great. Okay, it's all needed in the body of Christ. All right. So with that, I want to say bless you all and shalom, and hopefully you all received uh, edification and understanding according to the Bible, uh, not only with the position of leadership, eldership, so on and so forth, also some of the principles that go with that particular role uh, for those who desire a particular position, how to uh, conduct yourself amongst those who are in that particular uh, position, the respect that must be had for that a, a person in that position, as well as a person being in that position having respect for others and that love for others who are of the flock, those who they who the Most High has set them over. Okay, we must all work in love and unity, and as the Bible says, be subject unto one another. Okay. So with that, I want to say bless you all and shalom. And at this moment, we're going to answer questions for maybe five minutes. And when we're finished, we're going to bless you all and say shalom. And uh, hope that you all continue to have a blessed Sabbath. All right? Shalom. We're going to save the uh, recording and we're going to answer a few questions.